All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, the New York Times ran a piece this weekend detailing the many very white privilege reasons that Bernie Sanders supporters have for not jumping right on board the Biden train. They spoke with voters like Robert Grillon, a carpenter and third generation Dominican American who wondered when the Democratic Party would get around to actually supporting the black and Hispanic voters on which they are so dependent. Quote, we love Bernie. Bernie's our guy, he told the Times while describing Biden as just another politician in a blue suit. Or college student Victoria Ware who said she was sick and tired of having terrible choices shoved down her throat. She told the Times, quote, a lot of my friends are disillusioned with the Democratic Party. They feel there's nothing they can do to be represented, that the establishment will pick whoever they want, and it doesn't matter what we say. Or Kevin Riddler, the president of a railway maintenance workers local in the Midwest who lives in rural western Iowa. He voted Trump 2016, but sees it as a mistake because of his broken promises to working people. Mr. Riddler backed Bernie in the primary and isn't much impressed with Biden, who he told the Times he saw as dishonest and potentially suffering from dementia. Honestly, he said, I hate to not vote at all. I know that's not the right thing to do, but that's kind of what's going to happen here. Now, some of the Bernie backers that the Times interviewed did intend to hold their nose and vote Biden. But as I read through the interviews, called from dozens that the Times conducted with voters across the country, whatever they were planning on doing with their vote, the common theme was a sense of powerlessness. Like no matter what happened and how much they tried, their voices would not be heard. Their political desires would never be realized, that in fact, the entire political world seemed to be arrayed against them. Now, I bet a lot of viewers of this show can empathize with that incredible sinking feeling of disempowerment. And not just those, by the way, who are Bernie Sanders supporters. Yang supporters, Tulsi supporters, non-voters, and some Trump supporters who don't see the values they thought they were supporting reflected in this administration. Now, as I reflect back on my own sentiments watching that terrible Bernie endorsement of Biden live stream where all he manages to extract is some insulting task forces while Biden reads a stilted teleprompter script, or... The Obama endorsement video with all of his pats on the head of Bernie's great leadership with some empty promises thrown in about how this time things would really be different. After watching the election slip away so incredibly quickly over the course of basically one week as the entire establishment coalesced and the entire media apparatus churned, churned into high gear, crushing the hopes of a movement in one week's time. Powerless, dispirited, impotent are exactly the words that come to mind. The demands issued by progressive groups and their allied leaders aren't helping much in that department, frankly. It seems patently absurd to imagine that they'll actually gain any meaningful concessions when they've already pledged their support to Biden. But in fact, as I turned this all around in my head over the weekend, I realized that that powerlessness is in fact a carefully constructed mirage designed to keep us in check and force us to give up. In fact, the populist left might be the single most important faction in America at the moment. Here's what I mean by that. Now, on the one hand, the fact that Trump is so patently unacceptable to many of us puts us in a real bind. How can we do anything but support the team with the chance to defeat Trump and do so enthusiastically? On the other hand, it's important to recognize that our view of Trump does not mirror that of the hashtag resistance crew. And that matters because it gives us a sort of asymmetric power positioning. For many of us, Trump is a symptom of a deeper problem, a problem, frankly, that developed when the historical party of the working class threw in, as the Republicans already had, with the wealthy. Money in politics, of course, only accelerated the incentives to cater to the wealthy and their allies, the professional managerial class, who also benefit from that neoliberal world order. Cheap consumer goods, cheap service goods, a culture, society, and economy all geared toward satisfying their whims and desires. So yes, as I articulated last week, I see the direction Trump and his successors could take the country as an existential threat. But I also see return to normalcy and the persistent status quo as an existential threat. I suspect some of you, especially those who are young, working class, low income, or part of historically oppressed communities, feel this even more acutely. So this brings me to why we hold so much power in our hands. For the hashtag resistance set, literally the only thing that matters is beating Trump. That's it. Ask yourself whether or not they would enthusiastically line up behind George W. Bush himself if that was what was required. With his lies and his torture and his plutocracy, you immediately know the answer. Of course they would, because the only thing that matters is beating Trump. Any and every principle is to be sacrificed on that altar. The very fact of their all-consuming Trump derangement syndrome is exactly what hands the populist left so much potential power. Because whether they want to admit it or not, they do in fact need us in order to win. 
Now, they would certainly prefer not to have to give up anything of substance in order to get us on board. But in fact, their fixation on Trump and Trump alone does give us an advantage. The only question, and it's a big one, is if we're willing to use it. If we're actually willing, in a coordinated fashion, to make demands and be willing to withhold our votes. Individual voters here and there making their own unaffiliated decisions are, in fact, powerless. But as always, solidarity could be powerful. The only question, and again, it is an incredibly weighty one, is whether we're actually willing to grab that power and risk actually being the reason that Trump is reelected. Because while I think it's highly likely that because of their anti-Trump desperation, Democrats would cave to virtually any demands backed up by a truly credible threat, there's, of course, a chance that they don't. And there's, of course, a chance that such a coordinated anti-Biden opposition from the left would, in fact, result in a Trump re-election. And let's not sugarcoat what that means. It means being ready to carry the Trump admin's actions on your conscience, including the orphan babies at the border, the footsie with white nationalists, the deadly level of sheer incompetence. It means being willing to be absolutely and thoroughly despised, seen as true villains, or perhaps an even greater magnitude than Trump. On the other hand, bending the knee is not without its own moral responsibilities for the technocratic indifference of the Biden administration, for the wars and surveillance, and national security state crimes, and most fearfully for whatever comes after four more years of a status quo that is an immoral slow motion crisis daily for millions of Americans. Not easy to know what the moral course of action truly is, but I know one thing. It's time to see through this mythology of powerlessness and start grappling instead with the reality of heavy moral responsibility and choice. Sagar, that New York Times piece that I started with to me was so interesting. It was great. Because They linked you know, to you, actually. They linked to your tweet. Oh, I didn't even <laughs> notice that. <Yeah. laughs> so actually, because... What we've been hearing on Twitter from all these like multimillionaire, you know, yeah. media personalities is that to even question what you should do in this circumstance, you must be so like privileged, yes. right? Well, when you actually talk to voters who are really weighing these choices, they're anything but. They look at the system and they say like, I'm not reflected in it anywhere. And look, yes, we have like a lesser of two evils dynamic this election, like we did last election, like you do the election, but I mean, it's just like one after another after another. And at what point do you say, no, I'm not participating, I'm not accepting that these are the choices available to me. Why do moderates get everything they want? Because they do that every second, maybe I'm with you, maybe I'm not. Right. And so the choice that Democratic primary voters made in this election cycle wasn't like, and I'm talking about the voters, not the establishment, the voters, wasn't like, let's screw over the left. In fact, they agree with many of the Medicare for all, many of the principles that the left stands for. It was, we have to appease these moderates, these centrists, these never Trump Republicans. Those are the ones that we're not sure if they're with us or not. We have to, these people over here on the left, they're going to be with us. Don't worry about it. these are the ones that we have to appease because they actually wield power. The question for the left is if we're actually prepared to wield power in that same way. Well, that's something, I mean, I thought Kyle Kalinske said really well. He was like, look, if Trump loses and when he does lose, I want you, or if Biden loses, I want you to blame me. Right. Because the idea of blaming me means that I had some influence on how that I had power turned out. You needed so me. maybe next time you'll actually come and listen to me. That's and again, exactly right. This is a very complicated dynamic for most people to wrap their heads around. But I thought you put it really well when you talked about George W. Bush. Friend of the show, Glenn Greenwald, had an entire thread I loved of liberals praising George W. Bush. Like, it doesn't look so bad now. Does he? Or like, Miss W yet? And I'm like, no, uh, I actually no, don't. No, we Not don't. for a single day. <laughs> I really don't miss waking up to the news and seeing 100 troops dead in Iraq. I really don't. Right. And, and that's the thing. Glenn also put it really well. I think it was yesterday. He said, look, the primary divide amongst people in the Democratic Party are people who think that Trump is the symptom of all of our problems or uh, Trump is or Trump is a cause of all our problems or Trump is a symptom right. of all of our problems. And it's just so hard for people to wrap their heads around the idea that so much of what Trump talks about has any shred of legitimacy whatsoever. Right. That's what we talk about here, which is that when you become a WHO China apologist, just because Trump is against it, you look like an idiot. Right. Whenever you say that, you know, that tr American trade deals are good for all American jobs whatsoever, you look like a fool to people who live in like Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Yeah. You, I mean, I can go down the line on so many of these issues. When you're not even willing to grant a shred of legitimacy, you actually hand the entire negotiating table over to Trump and the Republican Party because they're the ones who can at least speak to that issue. 
and I've always, I've always have to talk about this, but the reason that I love this show and I like talking to other people on the populist left is I actually think it's a better politics mm -hmm. whenever people are actually scrapping over what matters because it pushes both parties to actually do what they say they're going to do in favor of, of working people because right now you basically just have some tokenism. I mean, I think there's a lot of good stuff that's happened with the administration, but I mean, so much of it has been taken over by Walt. I don't think that faction would even exist in right. a place where the populist left had actual power and rule the Democratic Party because they would have had no political space in order to exist because they would be getting called out on it. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I really realized in thinking this through over the weekend, it's something we've talked about mm -hmm. before, but I didn't quite totally factor it into this dynamic that we're living through right now, is that, look, Trump was such a sort of stylistic break from the norm. His way of doing this is so different that it really freaked people out. And I get that. I mean, I was I was right there like, what mm -hmm. the heck is going on? Who is, how did this happen? Like, what does he really want? What is he after? What is this administration going to look like? That really freaked people out. And the media filled in the void and basically convinced a significant chunk of the Democratic Party that he is like Hitler. I mean, really. And yeah, then if, if you're dealing with like, this is Hitler, then yes, I would vote for George W. Bush, <laughs> right? I mean, truly. Yeah, and that's right. what you're getting at with like, is he the end-all, be-all cause of all the problems, or is he a symptom of deeper problems? Because if he's a symptom of deeper problems, which is what I believe and what I think many on the left believe, then your approach and the way that you handle this calculus is different. So while most of the mainstream media and Democratic establishment and many Democratic voters look at this like, you know, Bernie supporters not sure that they're going to get on board, not really quite sure what they're going to do, and they're like, are you crazy? Like, of course, of course you would vote for Michael Bloomberg or or George W. or whoever right. could get this. Of course you would. It all comes down to these sort of different ways that Trump is ultimately viewed, which changes the calculus. And so, look, as I laid out, I don't think it's an easy decision to figure out what the right course of action is, what the right moral course of action is. I think it's very complicated. But the reason that it's complicated for us versus like Kamala supporters or mm. Pete supporters or, you know, the sort of mainstream of the Democratic Party all comes down to that view of Trump. Right. I think that's exactly it. All right. All right, next on Rising, friend of the show, Zedjelani, is up next. He's going to weigh in on Biden's rebuttal ad on China, whether it's an effective strategy against Trump when Rising continues.